International Press Club, a panel of climate change experts takes us through their hopes and expectations for the Glasgow Climate Talks. Professor Mark Howden from ANU, Dr Sarah Perkins Kirkpatrick of UNSW and Professor Frank Yotso from ANU addressing the National Press Club. Yuma, hello and welcome to the National Press Club of Australia for today's Westpac Address. We broadcast live today from Ngunnawal Ngambri country here in the nation's capital and we honour the elders and ancestors of the oldest continuing cultures on the planet, a towering achievement to inspire all Australians. I'm Misha Schubert, a Vice President of the National Press Club and I also happen to be CEO of Science and Technology Australia. In an impeccable piece of timing, so impeccable that we may have planned it that way, uh, today's address comes as the world sits on the runway to the crucial COP world leaders meeting in Glasgow. It's a crucial time for humanity and a really important set of discussions that are about to unfold across the next fortnight. To set the scene, we've invited two of the nation's leading climate scientists, Professor Mark Howden and Dr Sarah Perkins Kirkpatrick, to refresh us on what the science says about the changing climate and the action required from here. And Professor, Fr Professor Frank Yotso, a leading expert on climate transitions, will paint a picture of the scale of the transition the world and Australia need to make in response to the science. As always, we encourage you to join the conversation online using our handle at Press Club Ost and the hashtag NPC. But to kick off this discussion, would you please join me in welcoming Dr. Sarah Perkins Kirkpatrick. <coughs> In August, the sixth assessment report from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change was released. It is the latest in a series that has spanned three decades. With every iteration of the report, the evidence that A, climate change is happening, and B, humans are by far the main cause, has drastically increased, as has the confidence behind this evidence. ARC states that climate change is undeniable, and it is our fault. Before I jump into the science, I want to explain the IPCC process to you, as it is clear that some of our leaders don't really get it. The report was authored by 234 international climate scientists, not random members of the public and not politicians. Actual, bona fide climate scientists that have dedicated their entire careers to understanding our climate. These scientists are chosen by their country to author the report and some of them are Australian, coming from our top universities, CSIRO and the Bureau of Meteorology. The report is over 3,500 pages long, dedicated to examining, explaining and evaluating the status of the science of climate change. Thousands of scientific papers, authored by thousands more climate scientists, have been synthesised across 13 chapters. Every single word must be agreed upon and this can mean in-person or Zoom sessions that run for well over 24 hours. The process behind AR6 is the same as previous reports. It is gruelling and it is rigorous. And, is, and it is this process that has concluded that human influence on the climate is indisputable. AR6 concludes that the window in which we can stabilise global warming to two degrees is rapidly snapping shut. It will take drastic action from all countries to achieve this target. Let me be clear here. Limiting global warming to two degrees is currently unlikely. And limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees is a pipe dream. Even in a world where every country pledges and follows through with their emissions to net zero by 2050, AR6 states that we have a 50% chance of limiting global warming to two degrees. We are literally flipping a coin. Other bleak conclusions from AR6 envelop how climate change is influencing changes in extreme events. The frequency and intensity of extreme rainfall events have increased over many regions of the world. The occurrence of bushfires and droughts have increased in many places. Compound extremes, where at least two types of extremes occur at similar times, are now more common. And the frequency, intensity and duration of heat waves, both land and marine, have increased virtually everywhere. All these changes are because of us and our addiction to fossil fuels. Of course, extreme events can happen without climate change, driven by an interplay of local, weather and hemisphere scale processes. But here's the crucial point 
Extreme events are rare by their very definition. They should not be occurring frequently and they should not be changing. If our climate were stable, there would be no detectable long-term changes in the intensity, frequency or severity of any climate extreme. And here's another crucial point. All of, the, all of these changes have occurred with just 1.1 degree of global warming. And we have seen some pretty disastrous extremes of late. There was our black summer, the recent wildfires over Turkey and Greece, the horrible fire seasons over Canada and California, and the extraordinary and sustained heat over Siberia last year. There have also been marine heat waves that have decimated entire underwater ecosystems, including our own Great Barrier Reef. And let's not forget the horrendous heat wave over Canada and the northwest United States in June this year. Lytton, a small town that sits at 50 degrees latitude, the same latitude as London, reached 49.6 degrees Celsius. No capital city in Australia has ever formally recorded a temperature that high. It is a figure that surprised me, an expert on heat waves. I did not think that a town at 50 degrees latitude could reach such a temperature at our current warming level. And I did not expect that a local temperature record could be absolutely smashed by almost five degrees Celsius, which is what happened in Lytton. Due to local and weather scale interactions, it is possible that maybe this heat wave could have occurred without climate change, like extreme events sometimes can. But the sheer magnitude, that is something that could not simply happen due to natural processes. If such records can occur in Canada, then it is only a matter of time before they will occur here. It may not be this summer or next, but temperatures of 50 degrees Celsius are absolutely likely for our most densely populated cities. What if we were to break temperature records by the similar margins? Hot temperature records are outnumbering their cool temperature counterparts by 12 to one here in Australia. If Western Sydney were to break its current maximum temperature record, by five degrees Celsius, the temperature would peak at almost 54 degrees. If Canberra were to break its record, the temperature would peak at 49. Who can possibly work or even sit in parliament under those conditions? It needs to be made crystal clear that changes in extremes are only going to get worse. Future increases are inevitable, even under net zero targets. The amount of global warming we reach dictates just how severe changes in extremes will be. This means that the catastrophic extreme events of late will not be the worst of their kind. New record shattering events will take their place. Can we imagine a summer worse than our black summer? Or a fate for our rural communities worse than what Lighten experienced? We need to and we must because this is the future we're facing and we are not even remotely prepared for it. Climate change is not new, nor is climate science. Human influence on the climate by increasing emissions of carbon dioxide was predicted in the mid 19th century. The heat trapping properties of carbon dioxide were proven in chemistry labs around this time too. What's more, climate scientists like myself have been warning of how bad things can get for decades. Collectively, we have consistently said the sooner we act, the easier it will be to reduce emissions, limit global warming, and the consequential changes in high impact extremes. Yet, here we are. When my children reach my age, global warming will be double what it is now. This means that in about 30 years, the global temperature will increase by the same amount it has since 1880. Despite being under the age of five, my kids have already experienced extremer temperatures much hotter than anything I ever did during my own childhood. One was born during the peak of a severe Sydney heat wave during our hottest year on record, a likely ominous sign for her and her sister's future. And if you were born after February 1986, you have not experienced a single month where global average temperatures have been below the 1961 to 1990 average. But climate change is no longer a science issue. Scientific paper after paper, report after report, have documented the plethora of ways human influence on the climate is being observed, the impacts this is having, and what our future looks like with increased emissions of greenhouse gases. Climate change is also no longer a communications issue. It has taken decades, and many of us have put up with reams of abuse just to get the message across. But the public viewpoint has shifted.
quarters of Australians now accept climate change is happening. And after our black summer, a similar percentage want stronger action on climate change. Since it is no longer a science or a communications issue, climate change is now an actions issue and we are not doing enough. Our federal government has finally reluctantly said that as a nation, we will reach net zero emissions by 2050. Though the details of how our shiny new plan will be managed aren't exactly clear. Australia does not exactly have the best track record in being serious about climate action or accurately counting our emissions. Kind of like a student who constantly changes their report card from D's to A's. We're also one of the largest exporters of coal and one of the highest emitters of greenhouse gases per capita. We also continue to approve coal mines, avoid federal uh, investment in renewable energy and throw bills out of parliament that squarely address our woeful emission reductions targets. But this does not change what we ultimately need to do. If we are truly serious about fixing climate change, we should not be putting a band-aid over it. We should hedge a much better bet than 50-50 and halt the problem at its root cause. Stop burning fossil fuels. AR6 is calling for serious and meaningful action. The vast majority of everyday Australians, even the quiet ones, are calling for more serious and meaningful action. We must listen. It is well and truly time for us to pull our heads out of the sand, put on our grown-up pants and just get on with it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Sarah. I should also mention that she is, the, of course, the chief investigator with the um, a chief investigator with the ARC Centre of Excellence for Climate Extremes and a senior lecturer and ARC Future Fellow at UNSW Canberra. Our next speaker is Professor Mark Howden. He's the director of the Institute for Climate, Energy and Disaster Solutions at the Australian National University and a vice chair of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Would you please welcome Professor Mark Howden? Thank you, Misha, and thanks for the opportunity to be here today. So Sarah has framed the challenge well, but why does it particularly matter to us here in Australia? So climate, in part, defines Australia and Australians. We are a people of a land of drought and flooding rains. Climate affects almost everything we do in one way or another, and it affects the things that we value about Australia. The houses we build, the clothes we wear, the food we eat, the environment we live in, the risks we experience. Our prosperity varies with climate. It goes up and down depending on the phase of El Nino. And it affects things like the joys of this lovely spring in Canberra. So if our climate changes, so do we. We are in part adapted to the old climate that we've experienced. So a breezy, low thermal mass house an old Queenslander works well in Townsville, but it doesn't work well in Melbourne. Ugg boots don't work very well in Darwin, but you could actually accept them in Hobart, at least for comfort, if not for fashion. But climate change is already here, and it's changing fast, as Sarah has said. We're already experiencing 1.424 degrees above pre-industrial right now, and we're heading higher, perhaps 1.5 degrees in the 2030s. As Sarah has said, there's many, many other climate factors that are changing right now that affect us. And importantly, this impacts on the things that we value. We're seeing this already happening, like back-to-back -back mass bleachings of the Great Barrier Reef. We've seen Perth dams only getting 15% of the inflow from rainfall that they used to. The Murray-Darling flows are down 40% from what they used to be, in part due to climate change. Our agricultural profitability and productivity is down 20% compared with what it would be without climate change. We're seeing increased fire risk with the huge cost to lives and livelihoods, our environment, uh, our people, our economy, from things like Black Summer. We've seen that already, and more is in store. We're already seeing higher proportions of cyclones in our, our, our region, so we're getting more of the Category 3, 4 and 5 cyclones, the really nasty ones. And the world's first climate change extinction, we have the dubious honour of claiming that here in Australia, the Bramble Key, Bramble Key Malomus. And that list could go on and on of what's happening already. Essentially, this just says that climate change impacts are not a future issue 
they're a real and present danger for Australia right now. We don't have to wait. Which brings us to climate change adaptation. So climate change adaptation is simply responding to the changes that we're seeing or that we anticipate. So it's normal adjustment in a sense. And in all the heat and light and smoke and mirrors of the net zero discussions and the 2030 commitments that we've had just recently, the public discourse seems to have forgotten the Paris Agreement and what's at stake at COP26. The Paris Agreement has three main goals. The first of them is emission reductions. We hear lots about that. The other two are climate adaptation and finance. And they're almost absent in the discourse. And yet it's really crucial. Climate adaptation can lessen, but not necessarily entirely remove, the impacts of climate changes that Sarah has just talked about. It can even grab opportunities from climate change. So examples here in Australia, um, some wine companies moving from inland Victoria down to Tasmania as a climate insurance policy are finding that it makes bucks for them right now as well. And similarly, in parts of southeast and southwest Australia, uh, at the wetter margins of agriculture, we're seeing people shift from high rainfall grazing to cropping, and they're actually being, being more profitable as a result. So all climate change isn't negative, but it is change nevertheless. So how are we going on climate adaptation here in Australia? The answer is not so well. An analysis we did a few years ago uh, showed that since 2012, climate research activity in Australia had dropped 75% against trend right when we need it most. Other countries were going up. We were going down. We're not taking this seriously. This is a real issue. We're not keeping up with climate change and it is costing us dearly. In Australia, we overall have fairly good confidence in our science based on our past research. We have okay data although not much in terms of long-term monitoring, which tells us more about what's going on. We often have a solid understanding of the processes that are occurring. So, for example, uh, the increased frost risk that we're experiencing in parts of southern Australia in spite of the fact that we're getting overall warming. So we can explain these apparent paradoxes. And our modelling, particularly in terms of impacts, used to be world-leading. We could have good confidence in terms of the impacts of any given climate change and the adaptive responses to that, so we could plot out a pathway forward. The issue really isn't the knowledge, it's actually about how to get it into practice, into action. And when we look at that research funding, much of it has gone to provide more and more detailed climate projections. And this is a useful but a very small part of what we need to mount effective adaptive responses. There's been very little on co-designed innovations, and smoothing implementa implementation pathways. <clears throat> there are only scattered policies and programs across the state governments and very little federally. Our approach to climate disasters seems to be more about clearing up the mess afterwards and re-establishing what used to be there in ways that actually maintain the vulnerability to future risk rather than actually reduce it. The ambiguity expressed about climate change by various leaders in Australia is a barrier to adoption. Some media coverage about climate change is not well informed and it muddies the waters and in doing so slows action. We can and we should do better. <clears throat> we could, for example, develop a national strategy which goes beyond coordination, which actively supports efforts by state governments, local governments, industry, community groups and others to have an effective adaptation response to climate change. We could establish an independent climate, National Climate Adaptation Centre which brings together researchers, business, governments and others to co-design innovations that work. Which brokers... <coughs> and climate justice is actually part of this agenda. Um, it's part of the things that Sarah's talked about, it's part of the things that I'm talking about and what Frank is talking about. We actually need a just and equitable response that is part of the agenda here. This isn't separate from what we're talking about, it's not separate from what the research agenda is, 
it's actually integral to that. And that's a really important point to note. This is not ivory tower work. This is about how to get effective responses into Australia that makes Australia a better and more just society. So that national centre that I was talking about, if we were to do it well, it would broker and curate the learning from the various adaptation actions that people are undertaking so that we can learn from others what works, what does not and why, so we can accelerate and enhance our responses. Effective adaptation empowers people. It reduces stress. It enables better strategic capacity and decision making. There is nothing bad to say about climate ad adaptation. It's a good news story, but we're not doing it. We could also foster effective climate governance across both the public and private sectors through things like the Task Force for Climate Related Financial Disclosure or things like the um, Public Governance and Public Accountability Act um, from the, in the federal area. <clears throat> and in the business sector, shareholders, consumers, regulators, central banks, investors and insurance companies are all increasingly demanding reporting on effective adaptation responses to climate. And so does the COP26. We could build on our existing partnerships in our region to help our neighbours adapt to climate change, acknowledge that some impacts, such as sea level rise, are effectively unadaptable. And in doing this, we will actually learn more and understand more about their concerns, often which are treated very lightly here in Australia. There is lots to do to forge an adaptive and climate um, adapted Australia. In doing so, we need to integrate the adaptation responses with the emission reduction policies and practices that can ad address the root cause of climate change, the thing that Professor Yotso is talking about in a minute. Firstly, by ensuring that adaptation responses don't add to greenhouse gas emissions. So for example, if it's a very hot day and we turn on our air conditioner and that air conditioner is powered by fossil fuels, we produce more greenhouse gas emissions, which makes it hotter, which makes us turn on the air conditioner more often. That is a sort of feedback we want to avoid. Similarly, um, we want to ensure that our emission reduction activities are themselves climate adapted. So if we rely on soil carbon as a way of offsetting greenhouse gas emissions, we need to understand that soil carbon itself will be under threat from climate change as we go into a drier and hotter future. Thirdly, we can assess objectively the cost of action on climate change versus the cost of inaction. Emerging studies indicates that the costs of climate change through impacts are something like 10 times higher than the costs of action to reduce emissions. This says it's economically rational to approach reducing emissions in a very ambitious way. To do this well, we will need to integrate the short term and the long term, the economics and the ethics the costs and benefits of emission reduction with the costs and benefits of climate impacts and adaptation. And when we do this properly, I think we'll see that it is in the national interest to both reduce greenhouse gas emissions significantly and rapidly, and also to step up our adaptation responses and reporting as required under the Paris Agreement and as will be um, an integral part of the Conference of Parties next week. That's what I hope to see out of COP26. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Our third speaker today is Professor Frank Yotso. He's a Professor of Environmental Economics and Climate Change Economics at the ANU Crawford School of Public Policy, and he directs the Centre for Climate and Energy Policy. Let's welcome Frank Yotso. So as of yesterday, Australia has a national net zero emissions target, but we still haven't got a 2030 emissions target at passes master in international comparison. We still haven't got uh, a plan for effective national climate change policy. And very importantly, we still have not got a strategy as to how, about, how to go about the uh, economic and social transition. The net zero target is important as a signpost. It matters for investment decisions and it matters hopefully for future policy making. And given it is effectively bipartisan, it might just give us a chance to put the climate wars behind, that, behind us. That said, uh, the government's net zero emissions plan that was released this week um, is heavy on politics and lightweight on analysis. 
Um, it assumes that we will get to net zero exclusively through technological innovation. Uh, it sees the government's role limited to subsidies for future technology and asserts that there will be no consequences that will uh, disadvantage anyone. In reality, most of the technologies needed are already in existence. Uh, what we need to do is to deploy them quickly and at scale, and that needs policy action. Um, and uh, that, uh, that, technologi that technological progress that the strategy calls for um, is important, but it is no precondition for action. So how to get to, to net zero emissions? The first pillar of decarbonisation is electricity, a carbon-free electricity supply. In Australia, the uh, replacement of coal-fired power with solar and wind power is well and truly underway. It can and it should be sped up. Electrification is the next step. Net zero means replacing coal and gas with electricity in industry, and it means electrifying most of the transport system. Then there are various emission sources in agriculture and industry, and cutting emissions there is a question of horses for courses. It can be different production processes, it can be carbon capture, or it can be shifting to different products. That's how we will reduce emissions down to a fraction of what they currently are. The emissions, uh, in, the emissions reductions in industry, transport and agriculture that are modelled for the plan uh, are actually not as steep as one might expect. It is difficult to judge because the underlying modelling has not yet been released. Remaining emissions need to be compensated for. Uh, that's why it's called a net zero emissions target. This can be done biologically, for example, through reforestation, soil carbon, or it can be done through technological means, including through carbon dioxide capture directly from the air, uh, powered by renewable energy. Somewhat curiously, the government's plan assumes purchasing offset credits from other countries. That could be difficult if everyone in the world goes for net zero. By contrast, Australia actually has very good preconditions to do carbon dioxide removal at large scale. In this way, Australia could become a net negative emissions economy. Australia could be an exporter of emissions removal services alongside energy and energy intensive products made using renewable energy in Australia and exported. Now the need for policy. Some of these things will happen as cleaner options become cheaper, all by themselves. But much of what needs to happen will need governments to help make it happen. That can be through infrastructure investments, market reform, through regulation to set minimum standards, and importantly, through financial incentives and disincentives. You might even call it a carbon price. There is already entry point to a carbon price. It, that is the safeguard mechanism in industry. It could be turned into a baseline and credit scheme covering more and more emission sources. And that then could morph into a broad-based emissions trading scheme. And among all the political rhetoric about the supposed evils of a carbon tax, let's not forget that any subsidies for technology development will equally have to be paid for and would be paid for out of general taxation. Putting a price on emissions is simply the most cost-effective way to incentivize emissions reductions at a broad base. Over 20% of global emissions are right now subject to emissions trading or taxes and for good reason. A sensible climate policy would also have other important elements. In electricity supply, we need to speed up investments in infrastructure, especially transmission line and storage. Some, some of the states are pushing ahead. We need a nationally harmonized approach. We need reform in the national electricity market and a mechanism for planned exit and more rapid exit of the remaining coal-fired power stations. Both will help create the necessary confidence for the large-scale investment that we still need uh, in renewable energy. In transport, we need a clear signal to the car industry. We need infrastructure, charging infrastructure in particular, and we need to allow vehicle-to-grid charging in order to make that enormous energy storage on wheels available to the grid. In agriculture, we need a real effort to make Australian farming become low emissions through R&D, through broad-based incentives to shift to low emissions practices, and probably also 
through a change in product mix. And we need effective support to ease the transition in those regions where fossil fuel industries are currently big. Now what about the 2030 target? There is massive potential to cut emissions in Australia. Lots of low-hanging fruit after so many years uh, of very largely policy inaction. At Glasgow, the focus will be on stronger emissions targets for 2030. Almost all developed countries now have a much more ambitious 2030 target in place than they took to Paris in 2015. That is in the spirit of the Paris Agreement. It was always meant as a ratchet up mechanism. Australia's 26 to 28 percent reduction target was relatively weak from the start and is now looking extremely weak in comparison, for example, to the 50 percent reduction target of the United States and many other countries' targets. Most of the target is already fulfilled and has been fulfilled through reductions in emissions from land use change and forestry achieved mostly through the period from 2005 to 2012. So by now that target is simply no longer in the ballpark of what is acceptable uh, internationally. And the argument that Australia expects to do better than the present target will not cut it. A projection is not a target. We set targets in order to define ambition and to then let that ambition drive action. The existing target is also inadequate to guide the transition domestically because it requires very little extra to be done. It is worth noting that the Business Council of Australia is now calling for a 46 to 50 percent reduction by 2030. Now what about the cost of cutting emissions? There are both economic downsides and upsides in the zero emissions transition. The bulk of the cost the net cost for Australia will come from the decline and eventual demise of fossil fuel exports. This is out of our hands. The political pain is largely around the social and regional adjustment in a few regions, mostly around coal mining and coal use. We need to create a shared understanding of how that transition will unfold. Governments need to invest in new infrastructure and economic diversification, worker retraining and social programs in those regions and governments need to resist the temptation to prop up industries that are in decline. On the upside, there's a real chance for new export industries that capitalise on Australia's renewable energy advantage. These industries could become very large. They will be in regional and remote areas and they should in future contribute to the tax revenue federally and at state level. More generally, Australia's future economic prosperity is in economic diversification and it is about the continued push into high value services. A final point to make is about a proper national strategy. We need such a long term emission strategy, one that maps out how to position Australia for success in a low carbon world economy. What we need is a comprehensive and inclusive process of working out how we can get to net zero under different scenarios for technological progress and economic developments, what kind of investments are needed and how to mobilise them, and how to deal with the social and regional impact of the transition. By contrast, this week brought a glossy report with political messaging prepared behind closed doors with some reference to modelling that has not been released. We need an open process of teasing out the best available knowledge and bringing the major stakeholders to the table. Out of that, a shared understanding needs to arise, or can be forged, in fact, between industry, federal and state governments, the unions, civil society, local communities. The universities and the research sector more broadly have much to contribute in such a process. There is appetite among the major players, including business, for a process that can lay the foundation for climate policy that will actually last the distance. If the next government takes climate policy seriously, then that is one of the things that needs to happen, along with a much stronger 2030 target and a set of policies to achieve it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Frank. Um, thank you to all three of you for setting the scene um, so comprehensively um, for a conversation. We're going to invite some questions from working journalists, but I, I wondered if we could just start by 
asking you all to quickly talk about why the decade to 2030 matters in terms of sort of, um, you know, uh, carbon budgets and finite capabilities to actually uh, intervene in a way that avoids that most catastrophic scenario. Hmm. Who'd like well, to lead um, us off? <laughs> so, uh, look, I'll, I'll kick it off. Um, so, so. The, the next decade really matters in terms of many things. Uh, it matters in terms of emission reductions, as, as Professor Yotso has just said, uh, that we, we need to be on a, a change the curve. In Australia, we're essentially flatlining in terms of our fossil fuel-based emissions, um, so they haven't gone down. They're not on track to actually um, hit uh, the 26 to 28% reduction. And, and so, so we need to turn things around so we are heading in the right direction at the, at the rate needed, and we're simply not there at the moment. Um, the next decade really matters in terms of the climate. Uh, so we're likely to exceed uh, t um, 1.5 degrees in the 2030s. So it's really only a decade that we've got um, to uh, think about before we're hitting that 1.5 mark. Um, and it could be earlier, depending if we go on a high emissions trajectory and with other things that might happen in the climate system. Uh, and importantly, I think the next decade we're going to suffer more and more uh, in terms of extreme events and negative climate impacts. And uh, and if we don't respond effectively, that will cost us dearly. And so, so there's a lot of things which need to happen in this next 10 years. Mm -hmm. There's also um, a deep anxiety, I think it's fair to say, in parts of regional Australia about making that transition and what that will mean for people's local and, and regional economies and their livelihoods, whether they have a job, whether their kids have a job. Um, how do you think uh, such a transition could be achieved um, without causing damage to those communities across this continent? Thanks. I'll take that very happily. Look, um, I mean, what people want is, is prosperity, jobs, and a future for their communities, right? And that's what we all want, and that's very understandable. Um, what people generally don't care too much about is what the specific industries are that these jobs are in, as long as they're good jobs, stable jobs, high-paying jobs, right? Um, you know, uh, there, there's been efforts to actually, you know, properly talk with the communities, for example, in central Queensland, just earlier this year, and that's exactly the picture that emerges. Um, and that's the challenge, right, to prepare for that transition. And it's, of course, you know, um, it, 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 there will be job losses, right? There is no way around that. Um, and there have, have always been job losses, right? There have been job losses over time in the Australian wool industry, right? And textile, clothing, manufacturing, the car industry, right? This is economic change. What we need to do is to create the, the social prerequisites uh, and to help along with the new wave of economic growth than, that can happen uh, in, in those regions. That's where the challenge lies. And, you know, I mean, new renewable energy-based opportunities are a real chance to create new industries in regional Australia, but they will not always be in the same places where we currently mine coal or, we, or where, we, where we use coal and gas uh, for manufacturing and processing industries. It sounds like you see a really important kind of guiding hand for government and industry in a concerted, sort of organised way in that process. Look, the international experience is that transitions along these lines that have been done well have been done with active government support, okay? And in fact, you know, the bulk of government expenditure in other countries, for example, Germany, the energy transition there, goes to that kind of uh, adjustment, okay? And I think it's fairly clear in Australia by now that this kind of transition is politically uh, a big enough um, uh, uh, difficulty, right, that uh, this is probably the, the track we're going to take. The important thing is for the government expenditure not to go into propping up old industries, but to create the foundations for new economic activity. Mm -hmm. Could I just add something? Yeah, sure. it's, it, we know this is going to take time. It's a transition, which is why action sooner rather than later is really important. That's why, you know, we've been talking about this, as I said, for three decades. If we'd started that transition earlier, it would have been easier to do that. And these communities, in changing their technologies and where their jobs might be coming from, would have been much smoother by now. Mm -hmm. So it's not, it's not something that's going to happen overnight, and we understand that, but that's why we're really pushing for it to happen sooner rather than later. Okay. Uh, a question from Mike Foley. Um, Mike Foley from the Age and Sydney Morning Herald. Thank you all for your addresses. 
Um, you've all touched on the point that um, government has effectively ruled out any mandated caps or limits on carbon pollution um, and um, Professor Yotso, you, you pointed out that the government is betting on technology um, to become cheap enough um, with public and private investment uh, for polluters to go green um, voluntarily. Um, there are no pressing deadlines or, or targets except for 2050. There's a, a quite a weak 2030 target, we've heard. So for, for the scientists on the panel, could you um, delineate for us how quickly the transition that the government is betting on occurring from carbon intensive industries to switch to green, how quickly does that need to occur for Australia to contribute equitably to the international efforts required to limit warming to 1.5 and also to limit it to 2 degrees? And uh, for the economist on the panel, um, sort of do a bit of reverse engineering for us, if, if you may. Um, what does the future of carbon intensive industry in Australia look like 10, 20, 30 years down the track under the current policy settings? I think this needed to start yesterday, to be completely honest. It needs to start as soon as possible. And in some ways it has. You know, a lot of people have rooftop solar now, we're building wind farms, especially here in the ACT. We need that investment now. And again, it's, it takes time. We understand that, we know that. And it's, there's a lot of model, economic modelling out there that shows the more money and the more infrastructure you put in now, the less you need to spend later on and the more you save later on. So I know, you know, we, we can't say to the government, build all these solar plants tomorrow. We can't do that. But we need to start putting that in motion ASAP. Yeah, so in terms of the emission reductions, uh, the science is pretty clear. If we're to get anywhere near um, sticking to 1.5 degrees, we have to reduce emissions globally by something like 45 to 50% uh, by 2030. And, uh, and the really important message there is globally, um, and it ties in with your um, word equitably, um, because there's many people who would argue from developing countries that an equitable distribution of that emission reductions is not everyone does the same amount that there's countries who should do more and there's countries who should do less. And so, for example, the EU and the UK have stepped up and said we're going to do more than, in a sense, the simple fair share. And, and that's based on equity arguments and, and there, there's a whole range of views on that, so there's no rights or wrongs when it comes to that. But very clearly the minimum is something in that 45 to 50% reductions and at the moment, globally, we're simply not on that pathway. And uh, the UN Emissions Gap Report, which just came out, uh, you know, illustrated that quite clearly, that there's a huge difference between the existing commitments uh, and what's consistent with 1.5 or 2 degrees. Mike, thank you for the question. And so first of all, I think we need to be humble about what we can say about the future, right? What we know is that we don't know, and any modeling effort needs to internalize that as well. It's about understanding possible future trajectories, not about trying to pin down an exact future. Now, you asked about the future of carbon intensive industries in Australia. So by and large, there is no future for carbon intensive industries because carbon capture and storage is by and large no longer competitive with renewable energy options. However, there could be a very large future for energy intensive industries in Australia, and in fact, a larger future than energy intensive industry that we currently have, right? And so everyone's very excited about hydrogen, right? Potential hydrogen exports, that's true, but you know, um, there's other products, both energy carriers like ammonia um, and manufactured energy intensive products that could be a real competitive advantage for Australia in a net zero world. And the biggest prize of all potentially is green steel, green iron and steel. Um, if we were to process just a fraction of the iron ore that is mined and exported and processed into, into iron using hydrogen produced from renewables and potentially pro process some of it into steel, using green, clean electricity, we would have a value-added sector there that could approach or exceed the value of the coal mined and exported in Australia at the moment. Mm -hmm. So these are big possibilities for Australia in a net zero world. Our next question from Tom Connell. Tom Connell from Sky News. My question, predominantly I think for Frank, but um, obviously happy for other contributions. Carbon capture and storage you just mentioned, so far, it's been a technology, which I think it's fair to say, has, has disappointed in terms of what it's realised. But we're also looking at being over our carbon budgets by maybe 2035, depending on what your marker is. Is there a future for it 
if we think of it in the, the broad sense, not necessarily something attached to a power station, but I know there's a, a project in Denmark where it's just purely about getting carbon out of the atmosphere. When we talk about this technology, is it a big and multi-pronged possibility where CCS might be a, a big part of the answer, albeit not something attached to a power station? I'll start on this, but it's definitely not just for me. So um, when we think about net zero for the world, then we will almost invariably work with a scenario where there, where there are remaining positive greenhouse gas emissions, which will need to be compensated for. And at this point, we think of the compensation by way of drawdown of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere in some form. Could be biological, could be technolo technological. The technological solutions have the advantage that they don't create create a lot of op uh, competition for land use, um, and they can be run on renewable energy. And so that tells you that Australia is a great place to run them. And what you're alluding to in your question is so-called direct air capture. We already do this at small scale, have done for a long time. It's, a, it's an energy intensive chemical process, essentially, that you can scale up very, to, to really to a, to a limitless uh, extent. Uh, the only inhibitor at this point is cost. It is more costly than just about all of the, um, the actions that we're currently taking to reduce emissions. However, at some point in the future, there will be a balance and it will become cost effective to do that kind of drawdown of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Yeah. Yeah, so, so um, what Frank said is right, is that um, there are some examples of that. So in Iceland, they're using geothermal energy to do exactly that and to pump it down into um, rocks where the carbon dioxide crystallises into the rock and so effectively gets locked up for a long time. But it's a very, very energy intensive and, uh, and, and a very expensive process. And, uh, and so we're talking several hundred dollars a tonne and it's actually much, much cheaper to reduce your emissions in the first place. You can do it for much cheaper than $700 a tonne in most cases. Our next question is from Amanda Kopp. Hello, Amanda Kopp from National Radio News. We broadcast to Australia's community radio stations. Um, the government in the latest report has talked a lot about the role of farmers and agriculture and about carbon capture specifically in soils. So in the report, there's one section that talks about um, farmers are going to be offered potentially $25 a tonne of CO2 that they remove from the atmosphere. I guess my question to whoever wants to answer um, is... What is soil carbon? Is it the same as just normal farming? Um, are we actually doing anything different with it? And are we going to be paying farmers to do things that they're already doing? And how does that kind of weigh up with carbon in, <laughs> in the whole system, I guess? Ooh, what a terrific set of questions. <laughs> Who wants to kick us off on that, Mark? Uh, thanks, Amanda. And um, so, so quick um, soil carbon 101. Uh, so so when, when plants grow, uh, they take carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, photosynthesis, uh, and then they transfer that down into the soil either through their roots or when they die and the, and the material gets incorporated into the soil by things like worms, etc. And, and so once it's in the soil, it goes through a series of processes where the carbon in that uh, product tends to get eaten up by microbes and similar things. So you get a more concentrated sort of carbon, uh, which gradually becomes more and more stable. And, and what it does is it, it settles down to a fairly fixed carbon to nitrogen ratio. So you get rid of all of the carbon until it hits that ratio. So depending on what type of material, you have more or less carbon, which is lost through that process. But once it gets into that soil, it can actually be quite stable uh, for a relatively long time. Um, and so that's the, the whole idea of, of soil carbon storage, is to maximise that. So there's several issues there. One is you're actually fundamentally dependent on growing carbon in the first place. So if you're out in a desert um, which doesn't grow much biomass, you can't store in much carbon because there just isn't the carbon to use in that system. So higher production systems have more potential. The challenge here is manifold, um, and that is in part... Uh, you talked about $25 a tonne. Some work at the University of Melbourne showed that that... Are paled into insignificance compared with the ecosystem value of having increased soil, soil carbon. So if you have increased soil carbon, you tend to have better soils which uh, infiltrate more water. So when it rains, the water soaks in more easily and they hold more water. So you actually have a bigger bucket to hold the water there so the crops and trees, etc., can use that when it gets dry. Um, and it enhances your nutrient delivery process. So that carbon and nitrogen 
when you start to um, break down the carbon, it releases nitrogen, which plants need for growth. So they're integrally related. The problem, though, is that that ecosystem service, which might be about $200 a tonne, is actually much, much greater than your $25 a tonne for climate services. And so if, that is, if you follow that logic through, farmers should be maxing out on their carbon, soil carbon already because of that value proposition. And the reason they're not, why most of our, our uh, farms are going downwards in terms of carbon rather than going upwards, is because it's simply not easy to do. You have to um, treat your soils really gently. You can't take much carbon out of the system, so you can't export a lot of carbon in your product. Um, and if you're going to build it up significantly, you have to add a lot of nitrogen, a lot of phosphorus and potassium into that system to actually match the amount of carbon you want to store. And that's really expensive to do. And so, um, so there's a lot of hype talked about it, um, uh, but it, the reality is it's actually relatively difficult to do and it's really easy to lose. So if you plough your uh, field up, you'll lose your soil carbon. You come into a drought, you can lose a lot of soil carbon. I think there's a lot of misconception that the fact that plants just simply use carbon for photosynthesis means that that's it, that carbon's gone. That it's the same amount of carbon will be stored in the soil. And it's not that one-for-one -one type thing. It's also not instantaneous. And, and like Marcus said, you know, if you have a bushfire come through and burn through a forest, then you've lost a lot of carbon that way too. So it's not a long-term solution in most cases. Mm -hmm. Our next question is from Simon Gross. Hello, uh, Simon Gross from Canberra IQ. I think my question is mainly for Frank, but let's have a go. Because um, I'm interested in the, the mechanics of net zero 2050. And I'd like to ask you to be humble, Frank, and look into the future. Um, <laughs> and I, I'd, I'd like to impose a 15-year cycle on this stuff. Go back 14 years when our emissions peaked, 641 million tonnes. Our population was about 21 million people. Uh, this year, our population is about 26, and uh, the latest uh, uh, greenhouse accounting, which uh, some people may, may question, says that uh, we, it was 491 million tonnes in the last year. Um, so, 2050 is two more 15-year cycles. Population, 40 million, perhaps buoyed by some refugees from Hong Kong and Taiwan, who knows? Um, how would we do net zero? Would our uh, actual emissions be like 100 to 200 million tonnes? and we'd be sequestering that in uh, forestry, soil carbon, uh, uh, CCS, whatever. Just give me an idea, at 2050, what do you think our actual emissions would be and where we'd be uh, burying them or getting rid of them? Yeah, um, so uh, there's a wide range of uncertainty um, over what would be the balance at 2050 between remaining emissions um, and, uh, and, and, you know, carbon dioxide removal. Would our so, remaining emissions be under 200 a million tonnes by then, do you think? You mentioned 100 to 200, yeah. uh, and you're probably somewhere in the ballpark. Okay. 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 So, um, but it, it depends, right? It depends in part on technological development and in, in part on cost. So what you can take out of the equation completely is the electricity supply system, right? Um, there'll be, you know, the, the occasional gas peaker that mm. operates on a hot Sunday afternoon, uh, summer afternoon, yeah, yeah. that's it, right? Not on Sundays. Um, uh, what you take out of the equation is much of transport, because much of transport 2050 will be electrified, right? What you take out of the equation is much of industry, because there's enormous opportunity for electrific electrification there as well. Agriculture really is a wild card. It depends, you know, on technologies for women and animals, and it depends very largely on, uh, you know, the, the herd size of, of, of cattle and sheep, really, right? Quite, quite bluntly speaking, right? Fertilizer use as well. So, so we don't, we don't really know. Um, and that leaves you, you know, with part of transport, a chunk in industry, uh, a chunk in agriculture, and bits and pieces. Now, population is a factor, but it is not a major factor in a system that has electricity and much of transport decarbonized, right? Because all you're doing by having 
additional people run around is greater electricity demand, which we will fulfill almost entirely from renewables. Okay? So there's a bit in the population equation, in terms of growing population, there's a bit more material demand, more buildings in particular, mm -hmm. more roads and so forth, right? which means more cement and more steel. So there's a bit there in the build-up, but into op operation of a larger system in a net zero economy, population is not a major factor. So where would we get rid of the 100 to 200? Where would we, where would we be um, sequestering it effectively? It would be a combination of biological sequestration and so technological forestry. forestry. Yeah, you can you can get a fair bit through reforestation. So yeah. and and that goes hand in hand with the product mix in in agriculture because marginal grazing land um, and I think that's you know that that strays into territory where I'm perhaps no longer the best person to answer the question. Um, yeah, so let's hand over here. Yeah. Look, I, I think it's a really interesting question, and, and as Frank said, there's there's some uh, emission sources will be which will be decoupled from population. So you know, if we electrify our, our systems uh, severely, but there's other emission sources which probably are linked. So so your emissions are proportional in some way to the population. Mm -hmm. So um, food, as Frank says, we probably won't be able to completely reduce the um, emissions. Um, our waste sector, we still produce significant amount of emissions across Australia, and uh, infrastructure like buildings etc so um, so that actually does tell us uh, that there are sectors which we do need to pay particular attention to where we haven't got the solutions um, in hand at the moment so we need to invest in innovation which delivers those solutions whereas we do have renewables at scale now um, I think the the question though does uh, come out a little bit more if you think about climate impacts so if you have um, 40 something million people uh, and you've got a shrinking water supply in southern Australia uh, the amount of water per person does shrink um, there is simply that's basic maths and uh, and so I think that is where uh, we'll see uh, climate change cutting in more um, than just the emission side of things. Simon, I'm, I'm happy to go a little bit further actually on the numbers and uh, I'd go for the absolute lower end of the range you put forward. Um, successive analysis on this particular question always come out with deeper emission reductions that are possible and affordable at any given marginal cost. So, and that's in particular a function of renewable energy supply costs. So the cheaper renewables are, the more electrification you do, the lower uh, you get down in the remaining uh, emissions inventory. Well, let's hope so. Thank you. Our next question is from Nick Stewart. I notice uh, when I look down the list of uh, journalists who are here, despite the change in News Corporation's official uh, attitude towards climate change, with the possible honourable exception of Tom Collins, uh, there, there's no news, court journalists, uh, news Corp journalists here. So um, this, I guess, leads on to the issue of how do we actually deal with climate change in, in a real sense? I mean, uh, Scott Morrison, Prime Minister Scott Morrison, could have quite easily said, look, let, let's get another 5% from uh, um, imaginary, uh, uninvented yet, uh, uh, resources that, that further decrease our, our climate uh, uh, impact. And so he could have said, we're actually going for minus 5%. Uh, that's why, rather than look at these broad targets, I'm particularly interested in the national targets that, that have come up today and the adaptation. How do you think... Is it possible for Australia to adapt to this climate-changing world, which relies otherwise on politicians' promises, which are not necessarily worth a great deal. Can I have a go at this one? Yep. So, yes and no, basically. We are in a better position than some other countries out there, and it, it kind of breaks my heart to say that, because there's many other developing countries that are, will really be very severely impacted by climate change. But there are changes happening that are absolutely inevitable. Even if we do reach two degrees and stabilise at two degrees, uh, you know, pick any extreme or pick any change in climate and it will have some or many negative impacts. So, for example, take a heat wave. More people will get sick during heat waves. There'll be a greater strain on our hospital resources. Uh, so there's a health impact there. There's impacts on transport, which then impacts onto the economy because people can't get to work on time. There's impacts on agriculture, on wine, God forbid, on coffee, that sort of thing. So 
it's not just an adaptation of whether or not we can live more safely in these climate bounds, but there's also the economic ad adaptation and the structural adaptation as well. And I don't think that we're in a position at all of what's coming in the future. So even two degrees, well, okay, well, that's probably the best case scenario at the moment. We're not even really that prepared for that. Thanks. Wine is very important. <laughs> I would agree. <laughs> So, so I think I think just uh, you asked particularly about the, um, the the carving up of the emission reduction pie um, to the uh, the possible and the imaginary, um, and and of course ultimately that that's a political decision. Uh, it's it's you know how big a number can you make and and still not you know pass the laugh test basically I think, and so uh, the that there will be new technologies uh, is undoubtedly true um, and uh, particularly so if we actually start to do probably what we should be doing which is taking the research and development needs seriously and funding our universities properly um, we would of course say that mm -hmm. um, but uh, but it's, it's, a, it's a core part of our innovation system and it has been ever since the Second World War and it's uh, been neglected at the moment and uh, with you know the numbers of staff who have lost their jobs from the university sector of COVID is just one example of that so if we're serious about innovation and discovering the unknown at the moment, uh, we need to start moving right now uh, and get serious about that R&D. We are running short of time, but we have one last question uh, to be asked from Tim Shaw, Director of the Press Club. Thank you. This question comes from Tim Shaw, Director of the National Press Club. The Minerals Council of Australia said on Monday that, quote, in August 2021, Australia exported $33.9 billion of mineral, metal and energy commodities, which accounted for 69% of our export revenue and were the foundation of a new record high trade surplus. Can Professor Yotso and the panel outline from an environmental economic perspective how Australia can transition to replace this export revenue with renewable export technology products if mineral export demand falls as we head towards net zero by 2050. Yeah, so certainly not all minerals and metals exports uh, will, will go away. What will go away uh, is first of all thermal coal exports, uh, then gas exports, then coking coal exports, pretty much in that order. Uh, and of course, this is a gradual process. The point is just to acknowledge that this process will happen uh, and, to, and to put in place the measures to replace this with something. Um, now, you know, wool exports used to account for a similar share in the past uh, as coal exports uh, account now, right? In terms of export revenue as a share of GDP. Uh, that transition was not easy at the time, I'm told. Uh, and that transition from coal will not be easy in the future, but it will happen, right? And Australia will be a prosperous country afterwards. Uh, and as we discussed before, there's every opportunity to build up these industries for manufacturing, particular processed minerals and metals using renewable energy in Australia. And beyond that, it really is a question of economic diversification and making use not just of our comparative advantage in digging things out, uh, but in services, in tourism, in education, in research, in banking, those are the, the really high value added uh, opportunities in addition and alongside mining uh, and resource processing. Well, isn't coal meant to fall, coal exports are meant to fall by up to 80% if the rest of the world follow their net zero reduction targets by 2050? So that's showing that we must, we, we, we need to transition. And we used to be one of the best producers, or UNSW used to be one of the you know, forefront producers of solar panels in the entire world. So perhaps we need to invest in more things like that that can then be exported to other countries. Yeah. And I think uh, what Frank has already said is that uh, I don't think anyone's talking about um, cancelling out mining. Um, there's, there's two big things there, one, one of uh, which is uh, ensuring that the mining process itself has a low emissions footprint. And so we've already got mines which are running on solar uh, um, energy here in Australia. Uh, and that just needs to expand out. So all of the trucks uh, are run in electric trucks and all of the machinery is, is run by electricity as well. And, and so that's one part of it. Uh, the other one is, is really converting uh, sort of you know, Australia just being a mine for the rest of the world uh, to that value add. So we, we add value to all of the things that we mine before we export them. And, and you multiply that number, the 30 something billion dollars out to 100 billion. And that's where our future lies. And it's not about being uh, just having a, a monolithic, you know, coal plus iron economy. We should have a massively diversified economy. Uh, we need to massively diversify because amongst other things, 
means it gives us much better technological edges, it gives us clean, high value jobs, um, a high tech and, and, and a high pride Australia uh, in terms of how we approach the world. Uh, but it actually means that any given sector, if it, if it has a problem, it doesn't risk the whole economy. A perfect note on which to conclude. Would you please join me in thanking our expert panel?